Prism, as well as other people who are working in textiles and photography and drawing and other um, more, I guess, esoteric kind of practices. So uh, I started off in that place in my story and then I um, used that as a, a kind of a way to look back on the role um, that Batik has had in my creative practice, but also how the history of Batik is um, in, has ideas of exchange embedded in it and, and how uh, its, its course of development has been all about um, uh, it, this, the, the words are not sufficiently poetic to, um, to capture it, but a, a kind of transnational mobility um, where practices and ideas and technologies have been shared along the way. Um, uh, designs have been mutually influential from um, from people like uh, William Morris, uh, from Japanese artists, from Japanese artists. Uh, the practice is um, spread around the world and it's spread from Java outwards, but it's also um, taken in many influences over the over the years. Uh, beautiful Pranakan batiks um, influenced by uh, Chinese cultures along the north coast of Java. Um, just uh, basically going through in and out of that kind of big world and uh, small personal world of batik. Um, that's what I wanted to explore um, through my essay. So I, I guess I was also trying to pick up on the ideas um, Nia and Ismoyo we'll hopefully talk about later also uh, in and around this idea of the macrocosmos and the microcosmos and the personal um, connections and responsibilities that um, we make through our existence in the world and how uh, we live in, in these different layers of interconnectedness. Thank you so much, uh, Ellie. And I think one of the very interesting things about your essay is it's very much from a maker's perspective. You reflect on being a printmaker and what it means to to leave a mark. And I'm wondering, you know, perhaps you can just say, suggest a thread about the impact that Batik has had on your own particular practice, on your thinking about mark making. Is there a way you would uh, um, encapsulate that? Yeah, I think mark making is always a really, um, well, I guess I was going to say it's always a really personal um, kind of uh, aspect of practice, but what I like, what the thinking so um, deeply about Batik has been able to give me is the understanding that what can seem like a very personal um, part of your practice, uh, like how you make marks and what kind of um, uh, what kind of aesthetic you might adopt is actually uh, intrinsically connected with um, the outside world, your experiences um, and the patterns of life. And I think uh, from my very first, um, first year at art school here in Canberra at the ANU School of Art, um, I really realised that I was quite uh, obsessed with patterns, textile patterns in particular, and I kind of um, have always wondered whether I wouldn't have, whether it wasn't a better idea to have gone into um, the textiles workshop because we have um, the old, uh, the old school, art school model in, um, at the ANU where uh, you choose a workshop and you specialise in, in that field. So um, I ended up in printmaking, but um, overall, I think it was um, a a great way to think more about that mark made making in a broad sense. So um, being able to reproduce the mark, um, to have a matrix, to have a, a trace. And I think that's, um, that's the thing about mark making that I find really fascinating is that, that trace that's left behind uh, that isn't the mark you intended, but is a mark that has, has come from uh, the process, the uh, it it might be quite tangential to the process. I've, I've made a series of works um, 
Batik on paper works and actually what was the most successful part of the work was not the works that I intended on the on the top layer of paper, but there was a, a, a trace behind it that um, that was the part the uh, I guess the unexpected um, part that was left behind after the mark making. So I think that's another thing that happens um, in printmaking and in batik is that you never really know exactly what um, how it will appear. Well, I guess perhaps master crafts people like Toya might actually know how things are going to work out when they get to the end. Personally, I've never really mastered any process to the point and I'm not oh. sure I want to, but I really love the reveal. Yes, there's something mystical about it. And uh, I should have said that uh, for people watching, um, perhaps to evoke the very sensory qualities that are part of your essay, because of course the experience of Batik is also about things like the smell of wax and the humidity and so on. I'd, I'd recommend if anyone's watching this now that they light a candle. So as we hear from, particularly we go on to Tani and Agus, that uh, we can uh, imagine the scene of uh, a Batik studio. This is a legendary studio. Welcome, Agus and Nia. <laughs> yeah, hello. hello, can you share with us briefly? There's so much of a story of what you have to tell. I know it's going to be hard to, to squeeze it into <laughs> a short statement, but if there's something you'd like to, to share, so we can hear the sound of your voice and uh, oh, sure. where you're Maybe coming from. Maybe start, he's prepared something. Yeah, you want to go get yeah. something? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, I'm uh, a part uh, that's uh, built the studio in 1985, yeah. And the studio is, uh, that is more, uh, yeah, more uh, concerned about the study for the batik, yeah, because batik is already exists in my culture uh, for a long time. And uh, because of that, I can study the story of culture. Because in my experience, when I become an artist, I'm already for a long time study for the aesthetic. But in my uh, past uh, study aesthetic, that is makes me like bored. And uh, because of that, I choose the art aesthetic with the story, yeah. Because of that, uh, the batik that is I choose because batik is uh, so not only about to apa yeah to to show the 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 kind of the visual art, but that is the important for me about the process creative yeah. because uh, in the process creative in batik within batik uh, the process creative is uh, apa ya yeah? uh, that is uh, okay I, I have a little bit uh, i wrote in this uh, yeah in the making of batik yeah uh, this this is in the making of batik it is not just to show talent or good to skill. It is cannot be separated from the thoughts of a refined spirit and this become a part in the path or creativity that unfold. That is, uh, I'm uh, apa, very interested about that. And uh, with the recognize recognition of UNESCO, Batik has been accepted as an intangible and oral cultural heritage of humanity. This is recognized, can be understood through Batik as a medium of art in culture, values and meaning can be accepted globally. The meaning that can be taken from batik or batiking can be understood as a medium of in-depth study and explorative as well as a collaborative culture within all sort of communities and a cultural all over the world. This is because batik function as a universal art language. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, can you just quickly tell us uh, what your understanding of this this word semen is? Semen. Semen. Uh, the semen that is uh, describing about the creative process uh, where uh, uh, the people and the world and the source of creativity become one in, in uh, the, the spirit of creative. And uh, you can see in this motif semen, yeah, there is uh, the house. Yeah, there is the house, the apa, uh, the house that is describing about the uh, our, the microcosm, because the house that is the represent the people with the deep culture, with the etiquette. Yeah, because in my uh, culture, house is name a uh, talam. Dalam is mean house, but dalam is mean me. Same. Yeah. With dalam, that is represent about the people with the deep etiquette, with the culture. We have bathroom, we have guest room. Yeah. We have, yeah, that is already organized. Yeah. That is so about the etiquette and sensitivity with, uh, apa uh, the the personal sensitivity and uh, you can see in this uh, the background there is uh, trees of life yeah trees of life that is trees and never ending always connect never ending and uh, there is uh, the element of uh, uh, apa element of the world like a uh, tongue of fire and uh, there is uh, yeah. ship. ship and then animal and animal on the ground yeah that is describing about the macrocosm mm -hmm. yeah and then you see this is the throne of king and garuda wing this is this is the symbolize about to connecting about with the source of creativity, yeah, and uh, uh, in 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 uh, in our culture, yeah, uh, in uh, belief, uh, we life and the uh, nature give me life because we life, well, everything is from the nature, yeah. And then we have uh, life because we live, there is some made life, make life. That is the source of creativity. Yeah, and actually uh, in the motif semen, uh, we have a black background and white background. And in my culture, always uh, there is white background and black background. White background is named Sweta Ambara, the Ruang Putih, Ruang Terang, and the Krishna Ambara, that is the black background. And like in the puppet, in the Sedo puppet, you can see in the Sedo puppet, there is two, two parts, yeah, two parts. One, there is light, and then the, the puppet can play because there is Sedo, yeah, because there is light. And that is the position is the white. That is the Sweta Ambara. And then the behind, that is the black side where the people to see what the performance life. And that is the name uh, Krishna Ambara. That is about the sun and about the moon. The sun is give me light, but the moon is no light. They have light because from the sun. That is the long philosophy about the, the creative process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Agus and Nia. The way you talk, Agus, it's wonderful to listen to you because <laughs> you show how batik is not just a decoration, but it's like a book. It uh, yeah. contains this uh, wisdom, this uh, spirituality in it that uh, is, is so dense and so layered. Uh, so the 
making of it reflects uh, this philosophy. So thank you so much for giving us just a glimpse of that. Mm -hmm. And if we now go to the to the north coast of central Java, uh, to Henny and Felicia, who helped put together uh, the story about uh, Zahir Widadi, who is a, a batik artist specializing in indigo. Hello, Honey and Felicia. Hi, uh, good afternoon from Jakarta. And um, I'm here with Honey, and we are actually working as part of a team with pa Zahir Widadi. Um, he has sent an apology because this month is, as you know, it's a national batik uh, month. Uh, so he has a lot of, um, you know, other engagements. Now, I think um, to, to just give a quick introduction, um, I believe that fate um, brought us together. Uh, we were connected through Pazahir's passions in preserving batik as intangible and oral cultural heritage reviving the use of natural dye, replicating the technique that our ancestors um, then use. Um, so this, you know, becomes a wealth of cultural wisdom that, um, you know, we hope that will stay in many generations to come. So I think uh, that's how we all started. Um, and this is so much stories that um, uh, we can share with you, um, which Honey can tell you a bit more about it. Please, Honey. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So um, yes, basically the story was born out of um, our excitement when we met Pak Zahir for the first time and listened to him talking about his passion with natural dye and with batik. We were in Pakalongan and we were invited to his house to see his creative process. And it was like we spent, I don't know, hours every time we met him because he has a lot of stories and it was so captivating. So it was, it was a lot of materials to write, actually. Um, so I think the idea, what makes uh, Pak Zahir Widadi is an interesting figure is because, okay, first and foremost, of course, um, he's a Batik artist, but his background as an educator, um, as a dean in the University of Batik, he thought about Batik and he also realized that batik cannot be cannot be taught in a way that is rigid and systematic the way you usually teach batik because it's all also about feelings. Like Pa Agus before said, there's a lot of thoughts going on. It's about personal, your also your personal um, your personal attitude is there in the batik. Your thoughts, um, your values in life, it will be reflected in your batik. So it's interesting that he also wants to educate people about batik, but he knows that you have to experience it. You have to understand it. You have to embody it. So it's not something that you can just learn from a book, basically. So this is um, interesting as well because he has the background in anthropology. So there's a lot of stories about the philosophies behind batik behind the patterns and motives and even the philosophical meanings behind the attitude of batik workers and batik artists and um, I think Pak Zahir's, Pak Zahir's signature motif which wins the World Craft Council Award in 2018 is called Tanahan motif and what's exciting about Tanahan motif was because Tanahan used to be a pattern, a decoration or a decorative elements used to fill in the background of the main design of a batik cloth. So it's like that small intricate things you see on the background filling in um, the empty spaces that's Tanahan. But what Pak Zahir does is he wants to bring Tanahan becoming the centerpiece. So those little things that usually you just see in the background of the batik uh, cloth hidden behind the main design, now it becomes the main design. And I think there's a lot of um, stories as well and philosophies behind this. I think when we talk about batik, um, especially about the oral and intangible cultural heritage that uh, Felicia mentioned before, it's not about just batik as, as a cloth, but it's about 
its impact, its uh, symbolism, values, meaning in the humanity, in the culture where it belongs. And I think when we see about batik, we usually see the batik artist, we see the batik cloth itself, we see it as a product sometimes, as an art, but also there's a lot of things behind it. It's about the farmers, the people who make the cloth, um, the batik workers, the people who make the chanting, the tools to make batik, the people who work with wax, these are the people who are never, <laughs> you never saw them most of the times, and you never think about them when you, when you have your batik cloth. But also these are the people in the background that we want to see, we want to show. So Tanahan has that philosophy of bringing something unseen to be seen because it's also a part of what makes a batik cloth. So Tanahan is all about that, about bringing um, these small things, things that you don't normally see to, to the forefront. Um, and also Tanahan, interestingly, is something that usually batik workers, when they work on batik, um, they only need to follow what the batik artists or the batik makers wants. They just follow the design and fill in the main design. But with Tanahan, the batik workers usually have the creativity and the freedom to fill in those empty spaces with um, these little decorative elements that is close to their hearts. Usually these are plants or flowers or patterns that are close to the area where the batik workers live. So in the coastal side, it could be something that looks like shells or ripples of waters in other areas uh, with agriculture um, aspect. You can see maybe uh, tiny shrubs uh, and leaves and local flowers. And it's also a way um, to say that this batik cloth is also uh, comes out of the workers, the batik workers' creativity and close to what they feel in their heart, their, uh, the area where they come from. And that's the philosophy behind uh, the design itself. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Felicia and Hani. And I think it demonstrates the diversity of batik, even within one island of Java, that mm. you can have uh, the, the traditions within Jogjakarta, which are sometimes associated with aristocracy, with uh, nobility. And uh, whereas on the, the north coast, it's, uh, there's a lot of different influences, the Chinese, the, the Dutch, the, the Arab, the Indian, and uh, perhaps there's a new, your sense, uh, kind of a democratic element as well. So mm -hmm. it makes it even more fascinating. Uh, speaking of democracy, let's go now to uh, Arafmiani Faisal or Yani. Welcome. Can you tell us about the flag project? All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, Flag Project um, started in 2006 when uh, Jogjakarta was hit by a huge earthquake. And at that time, I was working with uh, actually community of artists, but then uh, working on environmental kind of uh, focus with the Pesantren Amumarta the Islamic boarding school, and this is the oldest Islamic boarding school in Yogyakarta, uh, led by Kiai Jawis Masruri. And actually we have been working together until today because they are um, doing a lot of things uh, related to the issue of environment. For example, they are creating batik with uh, natural dye and then um, producing also um, biofuel from uh, nyamplum, buah nyamplum. I don't know what is in English the term, <laughs> sorry. Um, and also producing uh, cosmetics for um, yeah, natural, uh, you know, bio kind of cosmetics for women so far. And uh, uh, lately also producing uh, minyak kayu putih. Uh, what is in English? Minyak kayu putih, sorry. I don't have the uh, word for that. Uh, anyway, everything is natural. So, okay. Then from that uh, activity, 
I personally come up with this idea of uh, making a flag project. And uh, there, as you can see on the flags, there are keywords. And the keywords is actually coming from the communities that I work with. So the first one is in Georgia, this Pesantren Amumata uh, boarding, Islamic boarding school community. But then, you know, now is already how many years, 14 years. I've been moving around places, uh, also outside Indonesia, working with communities here and there. So then, um, yeah, the keywords um, coming from um, various cultural backgrounds and belief system. And um, yeah, I bring these flags everywhere and perform it together with the community that I work with, wherever uh, it is. It can be, of course, Indonesia, Georgia, East Java, Bali, and then uh, abroad, Singapore, Malaysia, China, Tibet, uh, Europe, Germany, Holland, um, and then Canada and United States and Australia, of course. Yeah, so it's been a long-term kind of project dealing with, uh, yeah, focus on environmental issues, but the approach is the so-called interdisciplinary kind of approach. So actually we are touching all kind of uh, issues then. But besides this kind of, you know, performance and this uh, flag installation, um, we are also dealing with the uh, problem that community have to deal with. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of problems, right? Um, so there's a practical side of this project as well to find an alternative and creative solution to the problems that they have to deal with. Yeah, so of course then there's a kind of grouping like a female uh, group, and then uh, children groups, and then, for example, in yeah, Georgia with this uh, Islamic boarding school, so the Santris group, but like in Tibet also the um, monastic groups, uh, besides the lay people, of course. So I have been working with all elements in the society and trying to sort of understand and learn about. Um, their culture, their kind of challenges, and how can we find, uh, yeah, the alternative and creative solution to the problem. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Yanni. And I think one of the concepts that uh, came through uh, in your work with environmentalism in Indonesia, uh, is it Khalifa? the concept of custodianship and nature. Yeah. Uh, does that come through in some of the projects that you have encountered? Uh-huh. Uh, you mean this uh, concept of, sorry, I... Uh, uh, Khalifa, the custodianship from Islam, the concept of... Uh, oh, okay, Ka Khalifa. Yes. <laughs> all sorry. right, all right. Uh, well, yeah, of course, I uh, uh, try to sort of reinterpret, you know, this kind of uh, idea. Uh, as I was brought up also in this uh, background, my uh, late father was a Kiai. Uh, but on the other hand, from my mother's side, it's the, um, um, how do you call it? Yeah, local Javanese, you know, kind of culture. Um, but of course, I have to try to understand this mixture, this syncretic kind of culture, which I see it as something positive, as something good. You know, uh, maybe nowadays some people think, oh, you have to be pure Islam and not to mix with other, you know, element of other cultures. Well, of course, they have the right to go their own way. But I think uh, I see it, uh, syncretism as something really positive because it embraces all cultures, meaning also uh, respecting, right, all the cultures. 
you can understand the, the basic sort of universal values of it, but then also able to uh, respect the differences and see it as kind of richness of the culture we have. Or we In, have indeed, and I think that's, yeah. that's a very important uh, learning in terms of people outside Indonesia uh, to understand that uh, syncretism, as you mentioned. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Yanni. Now let's go on to uh, an exchange with uh, Carla Van Lun, who's also explored the, uh, the north coast of central Java, and uh, but also involved in collaborations with Batik. Uh, hello, Carla. Can you tell us about uh, your collaboration with uh, Wayu? Yeah, certainly, Kevin. And I thought I should acknowledge first off as well that uh, the platform that came before Garland, the Sangam network, was what first took me to Indonesia and Central Java. Um, so that, and I met Pak uh, Zahir um, through that and, and got quite a batik education. So I have to say thank you for that. Um, and it's been quite a love affair with Indonesia and Batik ever since. Um, so yeah, this story is uh, begins in Surabaya, which is the city where Wayu uh, lives, who is, he is a Batik designer and an entrepreneur. And unfortunately he couldn't get on the call this afternoon, um, left it a bit, little bit late to organize it. I'm sorry about that, but um, maybe one day he will speak to the Garland network. So um, this image here is of some, and this, that's why you're there. <laughs> Um, so the article yeah, begins on a work trip to Surabaya. Um, I had the good fortune of working with uh, the Australian government to deliver workshops and um, to teach Indonesian fashion designers and textile designers. And Wayu was one of the participants. And the workshop um, in this case was based in his home city of Surabaya. And uh, after the workshop, I um, was taken out by Wayu, um, you know, late in the evening, Indonesian style after a big day, no rest, uh, it's heaps of time in traffic and traipsing here, there and everywhere as everyone would know how spontaneous and nonstop life in Java is. <laughs> um, so it's a bit of a story about Wayu showing me the ropes of batik in, in Surabaya, um, teaching me about fabrics and history and the different cultural influences and then his designs um, are really beautiful as well. And they are a bit divergent from traditional Javanese motifs. He has a real love of flamboyance. Um, and while he's very inspired by traditional uh, batik, he has, I guess, a European flavor to his work too. He loves Art Nouveau and a lot of his work you'll see um, embodies that very, you know, beautiful naturalistic curved lines of, Art Nouveau, but then with the Javanese, you know, fine motifs within that. Um, so this is some of his work. And he is also really inspired by Australian Indigenous art. Um, and I think there are so many commonalities between Batik and Indi Australia's Indigenous art. And of course, there have been exchanges that have happened. Um, uh, so this is some of Wayu's, the images are a mix of both Wayu's and my work. So I guess to give a bit more story, I have a fashion design background and I have always wanted to create some batik of my own. And so last year I did uh, pull together um, a little fashion collection with Wayu's help and created some fabrics with batik artisans on Madura, which is where Wayu produces all of his batik. And this is a picture of his shirt, men's shirt, and I managed to put together a beautiful fashion presentation in Brisbane, but it wasn't a mere catwalk show. It was a whole evening uh, teaching people about what you're all saying, the intangible cultural, uh, intangible um, culture of humanity, which is um, Javanese or Indonesian batik and teaching Australians who are in the audience about the process and some of the meaning behind the works. And of course, my own work is a complete divergence from Javanese motifs. It's very figurative and quite simplistic and minimalist compared to um, Indonesian batik, but that was intentional because I really would like to translate batik to a more Western audience um, to make it look less Javanese in color and motifs and my own 
motifs have their own um, meaning, which are inspired by nature and spirit. And if you want to know more, I'm sure you can read the article. Um, and there has been, after this presentation, more interest for our work and why you and I are continuing to collaborate. Here's a recent arrival. Um, this is some silk scarves. It's been made in Majura with my um, illustrations. And it's a, a bunch of these scarves have been commissioned by a client in Brisbane. So slowly but surely, I hope to bring, to facilitate that batik exchange. Thank you so Thank much, uh, Carla. And I certainly... Looking forward to more of your uh, Instagram posts for this issue. Uh, Carla's also our social curator, so uh, connecting with the very active network of uh, people on Instagram in Indonesia and uh, some very lively posts have broken all records in terms of <laughs> the number of uh, likes and so on that we've had. So it's really great that you're helping us to, to reach out like that, Carla. Thank you. And if we could now go to uh, Professor Goddard, Pak Julian, uh, who's written this uh, article about Tisna Sanjaya. Are you still there, Julian? Yeah, yeah. Can you see me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Uh, first, can I thank you, Kevin, for the invitation to participate in the, this uh, edition of Garland. Uh, really means a lot to me, but uh, I also would like to congratulate you on the uh, on what a wonderful um, enterprise and project Garland has been over so many years. So thank you. Uh, and uh, hi to everybody. Um, yeah, so I, um, you know, this isn't about Batik in any sense at all, uh, but it's more to do with uh, Pak Tisna, Tisna Sanjaya, a very well-known high profile artist in Indonesia, lives in Bandung, um, I've known Tisna now for about five years, but uh, I was aware of him before meeting him, and I met him in Melbourne, ironically, and have uh, had uh, contact with him in uh, Bandung, where he lives. And um, yeah, look, Tisna uh, sort of uh, what attracted me to Tisna's artwork, uh, I guess, goes back quite a long time, in as much as that. Uh, I first went to Indonesia, Jakarta in 1974 and um, looking to track down an old friend who joined uh, an Indonesian spiritualist group called Subud. And, um, and eventually my partner and I uh, did also join Subud. And, uh, but as an artist and an art academic, I've had a lot of contact, uh, mainly in Jakarta with IKJ uh, and um, made friends over there, up there over 40 years. So I always knew about Tisna, uh, but it wasn't until recently that I met him. But uh, for me, he's just uh, uh, symbolic of this kind of um, relationship between art and not just craft, but um, ideas about uh, artwork and craft work to an extension of a kind of spiritual or kejuan uh the the idea that um uh i think uh uh the idea of some sort of connectedness through to nature um through the practices of art you know tisna's work is it's not only environmental it's also highly political uh quite controversial uh but it, it talks about uh, a kind of environmentalism that has to do with um the well-being not only of the environment but also of the spirit of individuals and peoples and you know the number of projects that he's done over the last 30 or 40 years have been exceptional and the way he conducts these projects uh, by participation and in you know um, engaging with people and helping people join in i think is exemplary um, so uh, yeah, so when Kevin asked me to consider writing something for this edition, uh, I zeroed in on um, Pak Tisna, who, um, you know, kind of incorporates this, one, one of the lovely things I find about his work that really fascinates me, and I've written a, since the Garland essay, I've written another longer essay about uh, uh, Tisna and the idea of uh, that's been very powerful in the West in the last uh, 10, 15 years about new materialism and the way that everything is interconnected. Everything is, um, I think Argos uses word seven, 
uh, like the way that creativity, people, the objects are all kind of the one same thing. And uh, interestingly, uh, I find that very much in craft practices, uh, possibly even more so in some, in most art, pra art practices, where the artist has to really uh, be upfront and make a very subjective statement. Where in craft, this kind of relationship between materials and doing around an aesthetic experience for me is a very, very powerful, almost spiritual experience. And that's one of the things that's really attracted me to Indonesia over all these years, you know, and since 1974, and um, I continue to. Uh, go back there and get back there as much as I can. But unfortunately, at the moment, we're constrained. So I'm very much looking to getting back as soon as possible and continue the relation with, uh, with Tisna. And uh, as I said in the article, the Indonesian art scene is one of the most vibrant uh, in the world. And it's very interesting the way the dynamic plays out between a kind of local discourse and its relationship with international uh, art movements and art histories uh, in a sort of not only in a sort of post-colonial kind of scenario, but also in a way of um, finding a, a peculiar and uh, distinct voice for Indonesian art. But I also think that also tumbles back down into uh, into craft as well. I just want one point I'd like to make about this connection through Batik and um, and a bigger international uh, relationships. Um, I'm not sure if people are aware, but in the very early 1980s, there was, and I'm not really sure about how this came about, there was a boutique project in the central desert in, in Australia at a very remote uh, indigenous community called Utopia. And a group of women there produced uh, a series of the most stunning boutique fabrics that kind of kicked off their whole uh, potential and ability and possibility to be able to make art, um, uh, a, a wonderful initiative. Uh, so Batik, <laughs> it's quite interesting in the way that Batik kind of stimulated that particular group of women, Indigenous women in the central desert to then make art. So uh, a wonderful international connection and collaboration around uh, Batik. Well, that, uh, that completes the circle wonderfully, Julian, because it takes us back to Agus and Nia, who were there uh, <laughs> in Central Australia. Um, oh, great, great. Uh, teaching, teaching that. But before we go back to, to them, I just briefly reflect on Jumadi, which is uh, an interview that I did uh, for this issue. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> he, uh, to reflect what Agus was saying about <clears throat> shadows, uh, Jumadi's work explores uh, sort of dark recesses of Indonesian history, particularly its colonial, fairly violent encounters with the Dutch Empire. And uh, I was particularly intrigued by this uh, piece, uh, which was uh, part of a dream that uh, Jumadi had, which informs the rest of his work. And for me, it kind of represents, this is one of the familiar figures within shadow puppetry, the way uncool it but he has through a kind of surreal way interpreted within this kind of dream that it signifies uh, what happens by transplanting this tradition into a studio with an individual artist who begins to explore it and how that can be a very productive site of exchange. So that sort of opens up the, the question, if we come back to where we are, uh, of the kind of interconnections between Indonesia and other countries, and I guess mostly Australia in this case. So I wanted just to put a provocation to you and uh, see who bites. Uh, and that is that uh, the role of countries like Australia, but you could also include the United States and uh, the Netherlands and so on, is to provide a market that uh, uh, these countries have galleries, they sell, they've got collectors, uh, they offer sometimes commercialization in terms of fashion. Uh, so it can be very useful. Uh, and this is perhaps what uh, outside cultures uh, look to in Indonesia as a, 
as a source of, of capital. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, put that provocation forward and to ask you whether you think that's it or whether there are sometimes uh, other sources of creative exchange besides just the simple utility of uh, selling that is involved in something international. Does anyone have anything to offer to this uh, provocation? A counter provocation? I'll bite. Go, Ellie. Um, obviously, uh, that's a very provocative statement, and uh, when I, dis I disagree with him totally, um, but I'm sure it was intended that way. Um, of course, markets are important, and uh, I'm, a lot of creative exchange can happen in commercial contexts, and there's, that's an absolutely um, integral part of it, but I don't think it has to be the basis of it, and I think that as much as... Um, what we know about uh, the way that Batikas travel is a, a lot to do with markets and exchange. Um, that in terms of the creative side of what happens, that that's, that's on a much more um, personal and intimate level, I think. Um, and I think that what we learn by, uh, by interacting with people in other cultures is more about um, ourselves and how to be in the world and how other people are in the world and and this is how we can um, strive for a more uh, just and peaceful society on a global scale um, if that's the way we intend to take it but I think that um, market uh, the market can obscure that entirely and, and tends to do so. Um, so that's, that is something to always be wary of when, when we go into these exchanges and, and, and these, to, to be always looking for um, balance and equity, I think. And I, and I think that um, the, um, Carla's work is probably a really great example of, of that kind of um, balance and equity where, where the exchange is, is a creative exchange and it has commercial implications, but that, that, that is not um, the basis for, for the um, creative exchange. Thank you, Ellie. Any other thoughts? Carla? Well, yeah, I had a thought. Um, I mean, I agree with what Ellie says, but at the same time, if it weren't for the market forces and the trade, the colonial trade that drove batik around the world to markets like Japan, uh, batik was made in India and Africa, it was made for the Chinese market. Um, the colors were influenced, the motifs were influenced, it really drove a lot of creativity and innovation in batik, which has stayed within the contemporary heritage of batik. So, I guess those commercial forces have shaped the creativity in really exciting ways that we enjoy today when we read all of that colonial and trade history into the fabrics. Um, so mm. I don't know, sometimes... I, I wonder, Agus and Nia, uh, your work is uh, very collectible. And obviously many collectors have purchased your work over the years. Uh, and I'm just wondering, how has that influenced you? Is that uh, something which you, you aim for in your work? Or is, is it just something that happens, uh, fortunately, as a result of what you're doing? How does it, what do you think about that in your practice? Well, from the very beginning, we never wanted to make art with any kind of commercial goal in mind. Obviously, if an artwork sells, then it's very helpful uh, to the survival of our studio. And so we've always had a wearable art line that we did as well as the fine art. And the wearable art line paid for the fine art when an art piece hasn't sold for a while or something like that, yeah. So for us, uh, we try to keep the art making as, uh, much as possible on a level of, of a kind of devotion creatively. And uh, we recently, in our culture house, we have an ancient Javanese uh, text study group. And 
uh, just when COVID hit, we were uh, embarking on a 16th century text called Salut Ambatik. And in this beautiful poetic uh, description of how women were taught to batik as a kind of primer uh, for their life, uh, and we mentioned in the article about how we uh, gave up the idea of, of batik as a profession, but as a way of life. And so uh, this beautiful passage describes uh, the pen of the divine uh, making the marks on the claw. So the creative process that we've described and Ellie have described in her article uh, of becoming one in unity with the micro macro and the source of creativity, this is a, a sacred creative process. So we try to keep the art making on that level as much as possible. Of course, there's the forces of commodification of art uh, on every side and our community established by our culture house Meet the Makers uh, for the first time uh, joined uh, at the grace and kindness of Amir Siddhartha, uh, the uh, Amir Siddhartha auction, which we would have never done if it weren't for COVID. And, but uh, interestingly enough, the artisans were so in remote areas were so honored that this prestigious thing had happened to them that they were in this international auction. So yeah, it, it goes on, on all kinds of levels and the constant learning process, yeah. And uh, Ismoyo and I were laughing uh, about, about this a few weeks ago. When, when our son was quite small, we used to go on the train every month to sell at the uh, American Women's Association monthly meeting. And, you know, at that time, at the inception of our studio, uh, it was a very helpful monthly input. And I was standing in this bazaar one day uh, mm -hmm. thinking, you know, I, I left America in search of another way of living on the earth, a way that's not a consumer reality, a way that has community and a concern uh, for our fellow humans in the way that Indonesia lives in such intimacy and friendliness and gotong royong, helping each other. And here I am at the American Women's Association Bazaar, and we're hoping that these, quote, consumer women uh, will buy our batiks. So it's like the older we get, the more we realize it's never black and white, yeah. And we've recently been discussing uh, with our son's uh, wife's brother-in-law. He's doing his doctorate on on jaringan, on networks, and looking at colonialism in a whole nother way. In that colonialism would never have happened without the support of the kingships in Indonesia. So everything, you know, colonialism was a reality and a very negative and arrogant uh, development uh, in the history as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, you know, there are all sorts of innuendos and it's not so much black and white, but a lot of gray that we need to look at while we're trying to shape, as Ellie described, uh, a just world, a peaceful world, a world with love and compassion, yeah? So all of these elements, I think we need to look at in a kind of objective way that, uh, that it's never here nor there, that we have to shape our creativity in a way that has integrity for us and to look behind to see our history and roots. And what have we done to the indigenous cultures of our world? This is a very serious question. And how do we try now uh, to, to recapture this in our project with Utopia and Ernabella was part of our exploration of how do we get back uh, to this creative uh, process of traditional cultures. And it was so interesting because in this Ambatic text uh, that we've been studying with Professor Manu, they talk about singing while batiking, so singing sacred songs while batiking. And although that practice has for the most part not been carried out in this era and batik has become quite industrialized, it was at Utopia in the outback when we were batiking together with the artists of 
Utopia preparing for the Asia Pacific Triennale that they were singing their songs while Batiki. So I think that we need to look on a global level and try to bring these elements back together to shape a way of integrity in our era. It's contemporary, but it's rooted. And I think this is the way that we can find a, a wholeness which has been lost by the extreme individualism and capitalistic mentality that has destroyed much of uh, the indigenous knowledge in our world. Thank you so much, Nia, for bearing witness to your journey between two worlds. And I got goosebumps listening to your <laughs> description of the singing because this came through so poignantly in the essay by Gopika Nath, our second essayist, who spoke about the Pulkari embroidery in India and uh, how she was searching for its spirit. And she finally came across it when she heard the women, the young women who were singing while they were embroidering, which for her was uh, a sign of its spirit continuing. Yeah. So it's good to hear that echo there. <laughs> I'm just wondering, Julian, if uh, you have anything to add to this, but I think particularly thinking of events like Arc Georgia, and there's a, obviously a history of tension between art and the market in the West. Um, do you see this, this play out differently in Indonesia? You're on mute. The Indonesian art market is pretty hot, <laughs> you know, if you want to describe it in those kinds of words. But um, yeah, look, I'm ambiguous about it. Um, I, I can see some positive aspects of uh, promoting Indonesian art internationally through the market. But the artists I have contact with, that's not what they're interested in. I, I think they're interested in making art and some of the comments that have been made this, e this evening kind of underscore the reasons that we make art in a really, really palatable way. And I think if the market then wants to come to be part of it, then yeah, okay, just as long as it doesn't spoil the party. Yes. <laughs> uh, thanks, Julian. And Armani, your, your work doesn't seem to engage directly with the market. It, but it expresses connections through solidarity. Is that right? Uh, through shared concern about uh, common issues? Um, yeah, that's right. Um, I uh, don't really have a direct, I mean, my work has direct connection to the market. Although some of my work, because I also do painting, for example, and some people like it, so it's like, maybe can sell some of them. But in this particular work, of course, this, uh, um, there's no such market <laughs> for this kind of work in Indonesia. Uh, but I actually I have uh, sold one <laughs> version of this uh, Malay Arabic version to Singapore Art Museum. But then, yeah, I'm happy that it is being collected by Singapore Art Museum so that people can, you know, see it until, I don't know, until uh, how many years from now on. <laughs> uh, nice. Yeah, so, yeah. but then, uh, yeah, I might focus more on uh, how to bring people uh, in solidarity and try to sort of um, share experience, knowledge, you know, because this is what I understood what happened to especially the, the indigenous group in Indonesia, but not only in Indonesia, everywhere has serious problems. Sometimes their right has been denied, you know, and they are treated also unfairly. This is like a common kind of thing. And now in Indonesia, actually, it's happened again and again and again. Although our president, when he was uh, being was elected, he promised that he will protect the indigenous groups, but it's just bullshit. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this is a kind of struggle that uh, many communities has to deal with. I mean, uh, that's just one example of the indigenous group, but they are also in Indonesia, for example, groups of the 
the poor, for example. And now with this COVID kind of uh, pandemic situation, it's getting worse and worse because they lost their jobs. And then how can we deal with the situation if they cannot even, you know, buy food? Anyway, so I've been working now with the communities uh, of young farmers uh, doing the farming in last four years now and uh, two years focusing in Bali as well as in um, Jogja, um, Tasikmalaya, Sukabumi, Bogor, and then in East Java also in Ngawi. So we try to sort of bring this, give the spirit to young people and teach them how to produce our own food. So when we are in trouble, maybe, I don't know when the pandemic, we don't know when the pandemic will be over, right? Mm. And uh, some people will have this crisis, food crisis, if, you know, this on. Well, I, I think it's very important, uh, your work going, uh, right? offers, and offers a framework. Yeah, so we try uh, to do something about it. Your work, uh, Yanni, offers a framework of solidarity, which is, as you say, something which uh, will be needed to face the challenges, the very dramatic challenges that are ahead of us. Uh, they're kind yep. of slow burning at the moment, but uh, we'll see dramatic yep. unemployment and uh, food insecurity and so on to come. And so by connect, staying connected like this, and uh, one of the projects that we've been proudly associated with in Melbourne was the Kasi project, which was a group of Indonesians who used this Gatong Royang uh, principle to set up a food cooperative and distribute it amongst the other two other international students uh, in, in, the, um, in the city. So using that particular Indonesian spirit of solidarity to help people in Melbourne. Uh, so it's something which isn't uh, only help to countries like Indonesia, but there's a spirit there that uh, we can all learn from. So unless anybody has anything else they want to say yeah. we can yes okay. uh Pak Nia? Pak Kagus? Oh, okay. yeah i want to yeah uh for me is uh the important thing uh about uh apa, the traditional culture because uh i think it's life is uh just uh just uh, survival, yeah. And uh, with the traditional culture, that is my way to survival. Because in culture, the tradition, no profession, but to be one. Like uh, when I'm two in my uh, art creative in Bate, my life is, yeah, I make the business, I make the art because uh, all I, I make a ritual, I make yeah, everything. And in my way like that, uh, that is a lot to help me to life. Like example, in this corona, that is uh I'm it's okay. I'm I'm just uh that is teach me and with the spiritual I can uh pasrah itu apa bukan berserah. I can uh pa uh apa still uh, stand up to 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 access to yeah with because in the modern now uh the the culture is become profession become separated yeah because in my life uh uh i want to 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 apa ya to life uh the completely the whole yeah I can looking for money, I can looking for spirit and uh, the creativity teach me what's the, the, the deep life, yeah. And uh, with the tradition culture, I can see the, 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 apa, the contemporary life, yeah. Also to adapt because in the traditional life that is very apa, uh, real life. To, to connect with the nature still the nature is still still apa ya still good like in the cosmos centuries but now is the era is already apa the anthropocentrist and then uh, 
uh, now we to make adapt to keep to to harmony yeah different like before we just go in the harmony we do in the harmony but now we keep control to harmony in life yeah mm. because of that i'm still using the traditional apa uh, culture mm. to life in this era Thank yeah. you so much, Sarah. And certainly the coronavirus does challenge our sense of a human-centric world and forms of interconnectedness, such as within this, uh, the Javanese spiritualism that you speak can be very helpful to us to, to see this uh, broader connection. So I want to thank you all for sharing your stories, uh, very generously your time, as well as the stories that you've carefully written for Garland magazine and uh, <clears throat> wish you very well. Terima kasih. Hati hati. And uh, just, just hang around for a minute and we'll do the, the group shot. <laughs>